superpower. I don't know if you know this. I have a superpower. I can't fly or leap single building, big buildings in a single bound. Uh, I don't have x-ray, eye vision, but I do have a nose, and I can smell all kinds of stuff. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but I am super sensitive to smells. It, it, my wife, from time to time, will, will clean, like, the floors uh, and add some vinegar and the stuff. Anybody here do that? Yeah, the devil is in that. I, I, I legit can't even come inside of the house uh, for a couple hours because that smell, like I won't puke. Like anybody in here or at home do the salt and vinegar chips? Anybody, anybody? Just leave. Just leave. I can smell it on your breath from here. You, you, you ever notice that, that, that homes and houses have smells? I mean, your house probably has a smell, too. You're just used to it. Uh, but I'll go into a house, and, and, and I can smell the difference of that house to my house. People have smells. I mean, some better than others. My 14-year-old son, we, we, got, we working on some stuff with that one. My, my daddy had a smell. Even, even, even till the last moment in the hospital, when I'd give him a kiss on his forehead, he had a distinct smell that to this day I, I can still, I can still sense. You see, smells and atmosphere and wind all kind of get rolled together to me, and and and, and that's my. That's my sense for us this weekend as we uncover in this sermon series being a house of grace. Grace has a scent to it. Grace has a smell, has a fragrance. Grace has a a wind to it. You ever been in a house, somebody else's house that doesn't offer in any capacity grace? Like, like, like you ever walked into a place where, you know, if you, if you move anything, if you, for God forbid, break a cup, you are in trouble. I mean, I got four kids. We inevitably going to break something. We come to your house and, 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 and in that house and that atmosphere without grace, you are afraid to breathe. I mean, it's suffocating. Like sometimes in that kind of atmosphere, I'm afraid to touch the toilet paper I'm about to use if I go to the bathroom. Because an atmosphere without grace, uh, 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 an individual without grace has a way of just snatching all the air out of the, out of, out of the atmosphere. But you ever been to a house that you know offers grace? You ever been to a place where you know you are accepted regardless of whether you break something or not because you're more important than the thing you might break? Where, where it's okay if you mess something up. It's okay if you drop some of the, some of, some of the sauce on the floor. It's, it's okay. You sit differently on that couch. I mean, you, you relax in that place. When you are with an individual who offers grace, that conversation flows much easier and much more authentically with that individual than if you are with somebody who knows is measuring every single word you might ever say. And you better be careful because that conversation 37 years ago, those words you said off hand are going to come back and bite you you see you see grace is an atmosphere where everything under god's creation actually breathes and lives grace is an atmosphere where all that heaven wants to do flourishes because it breathes in and out of grace we're in this eight-week series about the dna the values of who we are as a church and mission and word and prayer and diversity and 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 grace is the atmosphere which all of those values are able to become real in our life you can't heavily do a diverse church without grace you will kill each other. You, you, you can't authentically be a church under the word without grace. Without grace, the very life-giving word itself can be used as a hammer to beat people up with. I'm tired of these self-appointed TikTok prophets who are called to, 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 to discipline the entire church with the word and no grace. Without grace, mission is impossible. Without grace, prayers are are, are fruitless. But with grace, all of the sudden, all of those things become possible to walk out what is impossible. See, without grace, it's impossible to align with what heaven has for us. 
John writing about Jesus coming to the earth. The incarnation says this in John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And we all have received, he says, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. See, what would it look like if our house was known as the place of grace that everybody in the Hampton Roads and the seven cities couldn't wait to get inside of because, because they knew that everywhere else they suffocated, but in this house, in your small group, in your prayer gathering, in your children's area, they can breathe. This is what I sense the Lord is doing this weekend specifically as he's wanting to breathe a fresh wind of grace inside of our home and inside of our hearts. If you're taking notes, the title of today's sermon is called The Winds of Grace. And we will look at at our church being a house that fundamentally, yes, is that of diversity, yes, that of prayer, yes, that of mission, and yes, that of word, but our house fundamentally to all of it is a house of grace. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles to the to the book of Titus. Titus is a letter of from Paul to an individual. Sometimes many of his letters are written to churches. In this case, it's written to a, his disciple Titus about how to live and walk out life. Titus is one of those small little epistles towards the end of the book. If you're wondering where it is, the Grace Approved Bible has paper and leather. You can turn there. This particular week, my My dad has seemed a little bit farther away from my heart than what I wanted, so I'm going to read from his Bible today. He is a King James man, and so we're going to read from it today, and I don't think anybody shall be heard of. Okay. See, I was wondering if that joke was going to work. I worked on it on the right over. Titus chapter 3. Let's read our text. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and also hating one another. Boy, if that does not describe today's climate, I don't know what does. Verse 4, but after, somebody say after. Oh, say it with some gracious confidence. Say after. But after that, after you were one of those, after you lived in that kind of atmosphere, after that was your kind of heart, kindness of the love of God, our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 6, which he shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7, that being justified by his grace. Say, by his grace. That we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There are four kinds of grace winds, I believe, to blow in our house today. And the first is this, a grace wind to blow out the old. You ever gone away on vacation? You, you tried to save some money. You turned off the air, the window shut, and you come inside and all of a sudden all that stale air is just hanging out. You, you, you can't breathe in the space. Of, it all smells musty. It smells stale. It smells old. And you are needing a fresh wind to come in. Just as a house of grace that allows for new wind to come blow out the old air, so is a heart and a life and an individual who's been touched by grace. Fundamental to the idea of grace is this. You are freed from the stale winds of the past. You are not what you were. You are not that addiction. You are not that past life. You are not that past this and past that. You are something fundamentally new. And the first beginning point of grace is you're not bound to what was. And the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, too easily and often wants to talk to you about who you used to be. Because if he can get you to live in where you used to be and where you and who you were, you will never walk out who you are, who you can be. 
And a wind of grace says to a, to a broken world, come on in. You are not the sum of your failures. You are not the sum of your successes either. You may have started a business and it went wonky. You may have started a relationship and it went sideways. You may, you may have tried to walk out sanctification and that joker fell apart in three seconds. You are, those are not failures. You are not a failure. Those are just failure kind of events. Nor are you bound by performance to prove yourself by your victories either. See, grace offers a new identity that removes the old air. And grace says this, you couldn't open a window yourself. You couldn't do it on your own accord. You couldn't change the stale air to the fresh air. It requires him. Look at our text in verse 3. It's really clear. You were jacked up. Turn to somebody and say, you jacked up. Not everybody did that. Turn to somebody else. Say, I know you were jacked up. You can admit it yourself. I was jacked up. Come on. Everybody jacked up. Verse 3. Verse 3. You were this. And he lists all kinds of ratchetness in the soul and the heart. And then he comes to verse 4. But after you were all that, kindness and the mercy and the grace of God has come to your life. I want you to understand what Paul is saying here. He is saying you were one way, and while you were that way, the grace of God appeared in the Son, Jesus. What does is, what is John say? While we were at enmity with God, when you were on the far side of the moon away from him, then he sent his Son to save you. Catch this idea of grace. It wasn't your idea. You didn't earn your way to grace. You didn't convince him to give you grace. He just gave it to you. Which means if he gave you grace while you were jacked up, you can't lose it after that either. Grace begins that it was just given. End of story. It just was. And you just are. The only thing you are required for grace is to receive it. You can't earn it. You can't make your way into it. And you can't lose it. It's just opening your hands. They pour it out because you want it to anyway. You didn't have to create a dissertation. You didn't have to come up with a persuasive essay. You just wanted to. So you did. And so I will. Here's what this tells us. Here's what this tells us. It don't matter how jacked up you are, you're not disqualified from grace. I mean, look at the list that Paul says. Disobedient, foolish, deceived, serving diverse lusts and running after other pleasures, living in malice and envy, a general hatred toward everything and hatred towards others. And yet in that place, he gives grace. It don't matter how long you've been in that bed of addiction, that bed of immorality, no matter how long you have struggled in your sanctification journey, nothing disqualifies you from receiving grace. And when the enemy comes to try to tell you, well, you shouldn't have got it, your response is, you're right, I shouldn't have, but I didn't get it because of me, I got it because of him. You see, grace emanates from the heart of God, not your good or badness. And when we make grace about me, we lose grace to begin with. Grace is about him, his idea. And it's time for some of us to open up the window. Let him open up the window and blow out what was. You are not the old heir. You will suffocate in your past. If grace was his idea at your worst, you can't screw it up at your best either. So grace was his idea. There's a grace to blow out the old air. The second wind that blows through grace is this. There's a grace of fresh air. Grace doesn't just add new air to the old stuff. Grace gets rid of the old stuff. It transforms what was old into fundamentally new. 
Your ability to just do more stuff for grace is just like spraying Febreze on the old stuff anyway. Some chemically altered, man-made ability to just spray things on old things only makes the air more stank. You will choke on Febreze air as much as you will choke on old air too. I don't need man-made Febreze, do this and don't do this and pray more and fast more to get grace. I just need fresh air in and old air out. See, grace doesn't just cover something, grace transforms it. Paul continues in our text in verse 5. He says, how did this kindness come towards us? How did this, how did this be revealed in our heart? Not by works, verse 5, of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. What happens? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. These words that Paul uses here have a sense of a new birth and new creation that is eternally better than the old one. In Romans, Paul would say that this new creation is something that has never been seen before after grace has touched it. You're not a gospel warmed over version of your sinner self. You are fundamentally new. Fundamentally new in your nature and character and every capacity. Grace comes and undoes what was and gives what is now new. Paul says in verse 7 that we're justified, made holy or right by grace. This word justified is a legal term. And it has the idea that you are standing before a holy judge. And the premise is you had a rap sheet. How many had a rap sheet? How many's rap sheet was longer than Pastor Melvin's? Not possible. Okay. That you had a long rap sheet. And you're standing in front of the judge awaiting his, 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 his evaluation of you. And you got all of the prosecutors and he's got a whole line of reasons of why you got that rap sheet, what you should deserve. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, your counselor, rolls up to the judge's bench and lays one piece of paper with one word in the name of Jesus on it. And when he looks at your rap sheet, it's as if nothing was there. The prophet says, for your sake and my sake, I forgive your sins and do not remember they existed. It's not like you got some sort of crap-filled, sin-stained clothes and, and Jesus just wraps a white garment over top of you that, yes, you are clean on the outside, but you still got that stuff underneath. No, 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 no. This word justified has the idea that you are completely his righteousness. You're not just covered by it. You are it. The old garment's gone. And all the father sees is his son, Jesus, made manifest by your righteousness. His righteousness in you. Paul says this, this justification, this new creature, is done by grace. Unmerited favor where no action on your account can make you deserving of it. See, a house of grace, a house of grace says this, you're not having to strive any longer to become something you already are. See, in a church life, we are so concerned about the individuals living unholy that all what we have done is created a system of do's and don'ts that create more fear than faith. I'm afraid to sin here. I'm afraid to do that. I'm going to cause this and cause that. And the faith of God to walk out who you already are cannot exist in fear. So rather than I'm going to do this, I'm going to work, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, I'm going to blah, 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 all the things in order to prove myself holy, what Paul here says is, no, 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 catch this church. You already are holy by his grace. Now walk out what you already are. No striving and becoming because he already made you something. What do we tell a broken world who are striving out there? Come inside and strive some more. Prove to you and prove to us and prove to God you're holy. That's not grace. That's Febreze on the Bible. What's grace? 
Grace says you have a Savior. He did all the work. For by grace you have been saved. So that no man can boast. That you are justified by the work of Jesus Christ in grace. And now when you come, you get a whole new identity. You aren't what you were. You aren't what you were. You aren't what you were. You are something totally new. Book of Revelation says it's a white stone with a name that only he knows it. That's how new you are. Are you still living in the saved version of yourself? Come on, grace does not just warm over what you were. Grace gives you something totally new. So that when you receive the work of grace, you've become this new creature, this new identity. Maybe you've been saved, but you haven't really received the new identity. We all kinds of all kind of saved folk in the room that haven't really received the work of the grace of gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know how you know this? Because you treat others like what you were. You hold others to their own old self too. You can't look at somebody through the gospel lens of new eyes if you haven't looked at yourself through new eyes. See, grace doesn't just get rid of the old air. Grace doesn't just, just remove the old air with new air. Grace actually just changes the old air to new air. This is the people that Jesus comes to in Matthew 11. He says, you are exhausted and tired from trying to prove yourself to what you were. But he comes to offer something new. There's a grace of the old, there's a grace of the new, but thirdly, there's another kind of wind, and it's this. It's the wind of power. Grace doesn't just invite you into a, a, a room or a house or a place to change what's old, but then tell you now, okay, now you're new, now figure it out yourself. No, no, no. Grace offers the wind of the Spirit and the divine energy to then walk out who you already are. A life of grace works in partnership with Holy Spirit. Come on. Here's what we do. Jesus, thank you for saving me, and now I got this. Thanks. And you're going to furrow your brow. You're going to sweat yourself into a place where you're going to somehow work with Jesus. I have been in multiple weight rooms where they got fresh wind blowing, but the air is still wet with sweat. Because people are in a place of wind blowing, but they're working so hard that they produce a level of sweat on their own accord that actually, purif or actually putrefies the air. This can be us without grace. We can be in a house, we can be in a prayer meeting, but working so hard we wonder why we're exhausted. Because the sanctification process that he's walked you in, the call and the mission of God that he's put you into place in your school, in your job, wherever it is, was not meant for you to do it on your own. And when we try to say to Jesus, I got this, we are outside of the rhythm of grace. You don't need another podcast. You don't need another book. You don't need another conference. You don't need to try harder. You need to get to the place where grace comes. The life without grace has a yoke, back to Jesus' comment in Matthew 11, that is uncarryable. This is why he says, my yoke's easy. My burden is light. Come to me. Come to me. Don't try harder. There's a, there's a Jewish idiom during the time of Jesus and Paul that said this, more Torah, more, more, more life. And the idea was that you have a weakness. You have an issue, just throw some more law at it. You get, get, get some more Bible to it. That is not the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is, yes, we need to have right understanding. And yes, the word opened up, transforms our heart. But it's the grace of God that moves us in partnership with him. Paul would say this, according to his mercy, he saved us by what? The washing and regeneration of whom? Your strength, your effort, your willpower, your 35-day uh, fasting plan, your, 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 your re Bible recap that you're going to read every single day? No, by the Holy Spirit. I can only walk out kingdom life when I am part of let his divine energy change my life. 
Paul would say this to Galatians. I love this. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has betwitched you, good King James word, that you should not obey the truth? This only do I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun something in the Spirit, you're now being made perfect or mature by the flesh? All right, Jesus, here I am. Thank you for grace. He says, I'm going to walk his discipleship out. Great, I got this. And all of a sudden, we're stuck in mud, and we fall down, and we're trying to do it all on our own. When, when the last time you jacked something up was your first response, come help me, Holy Spirit. Come help me. I'm weak. I'm exhausted. I don't know how to do this. Come help me. Come help me. Why does the writer of Hebrews say, in our time of need, we come to a throne of mercy, forgiveness of sin, and grace, the empowerment over sin. We have a compassionate high priest, Hebrews 4, that does not expect you to do it on your own. Where are you trying to walk out whatever God has for you in your own strength? And where is the fresh leaning in on his grace, the place of life for you? We're not going to walk out discipleship, Christ-likeness, and all that God has for us on our own accord. As we walk through this transition, there's been a number of times I have just been overwhelmed by the requirement that leading our church needs. And, and the other day, I'm, I'm, I'm on a walk around my neighborhood, and I just said to the Lord, Lord, I can't do this. This is Great. Maybe I asked the wrong question. Jesus, I, I, I got this. He goes, that's a great starting point and also ending point. And he reminded me of the verse in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and he says, who is this, this woman who's coming out of the wilderness, a place of hardship and pain and sorrow and just unknown, right? You could, you could metaphor for lots of things. Leaning on her beloved what, what's the imagery here? It's that the woman, the bride, right, us, doesn't know how to get going. It's weak and, and is not able to walk this out. So how is she going to get out of the wilderness into the place of springtime? She's leaning. She is resting. She's using the strength of her beloved, our groom, our Savior, to then walk up forward. And you know what's amazing is this. When I recognize my weakness, when I recognize that I can't do this on my own accord, I stay leaning on him and I feel the strength of his arm. I feel the roughness of his, of his beard. I smell the food that he had on his breath and I sense closeness and I sense strength and I, and I can actually get where I'm going. But the moment I get strong enough, the moment I get smart enough, the moment I read that book and listen to that podcast, I start walking on my own strength and I start going, faster or farther different place and what happens there is now a distance from where I am to where he is all because I'm strong he says no son maybe 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 Joel maybe you need to look at your weakness different maybe your weakness is actually my gift to you because it keeps you close because it keeps you leaning. And God forbid I ever get too strong for myself that I don't need his grace. I start walking out on my own accord. This is what Paul said, that my grace is sufficient for what is present in your life. Your weakness towards that place of sanctification, your weakness toward that ministry, your weakness towards walking out that, that the mission place in your job is not meant for you. The grace of God comes as a gift of God to keep you close. Your weakness is not a curse. It's a gift. It's a gift. Do you see it that way? Can you rejoice in the dependence on his spirit rather than let the enemy beat you up for it? Or some self-appointed prophet that said you should have learned this by now. See, the grace of God as the source of spirit empowerment 
will always be the marker of the believer. Because we're not meant to walk out on our own. And he always puts us in places that we need him. It's the grace wind of power. And lastly, as we finish, there's the grace wind of hope. Grace doesn't just forgive what was. Grace doesn't just empower you to walk something out. But grace actually moves you to a new place. Grace moves you to a new house that has a higher elevation so you can see out the window for what may come. It's amazing how when I'm bound up in the past, I can't actually walk out what God has for me in the future. I'm too bound by who I was. I'm too bound. My eyes are too down, striving to walk on my own accord rather than lean on him so I can look at the horizon and see where he's taking me. What does our text say? How does Paul finish this? That being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. When the air is clear, fresh and blowing, new has come and dependent upon him, I'm in a new place and now I can see the future. Now I'm not scared of what can be. Hope is present for what can be because I am positioned in a new place to see. This word that Paul uses, because grace has come as an heir, it means an inheritor of what a father would give to a son. Everything that the father had to give to Jesus, you now also get. And scripture says you are seated with him in the co-heir at the right hand of the father. Now you can see all that lay ahead. See, grace comes to offer a hope for what can be. Because if his grace can touch the past, if his grace can touch the present, then assuredly his grace is in the future for me. What does Paul say about a new trajectory of hope given to us with grace? Romans 5, through him also we have access by faith into grace in which we stand with hope from God. 2 Thessalonians, now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God, our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through, because, with, and in grace. There's no more dreading. No more fear what the future has because grace has touched your heart. Now, now what can be is filled with hope. On your job, in your business, in your family, there's no more dread because grace touched you. The future is secure because of grace. So I was praying for today. I saw this picture of many of us walking down the street. We're coming to the end of the block, and there was a really big building square right, right off to the edge. We had a, we had, the future God had for us was to the right. And I saw many of us walking, and we just stopped, afraid to turn the corner and walk into the future because we were unsure what lay ahead. Not unsure like, I'm, just, I'm wondering, unsure like afraid fearful because the past has been hard the presence of struggles oh good lord i don't want to know what's coming tomorrow and i sense the lord saying i want to give hope for the future by offering grace right now my sense is that this fourth wind is where the lord would have his end that there are those in the room that there is a fear. Like not, not just I'm kind of wondering, I'm sure there's no, there's an actual fear in your soul about tomorrow. And it has frozen you to turn the corner. And the Lord wants to come with grace now and touch your heart. The fear would be removed 
and confidence in grace would grow. So if that's you today, if you'd say, there is a legit fear around my heart for what can be. We want to pray for grace to come for the future. Would you right now where you are? At home, if you're online, you can identify yourself at home. But if that's you right here in the room, would you stand up to your feet? See, there, there's a fear for tomorrow. You may not even be able to go to sleep at night, my senses. You're afraid to go to sleep because of what tomorrow may bring. And it's gripped you. And you've tried all the stuff. You just can't. You just can't. It hasn't changed. There's a grace right now. Who else? Who else? Who else? There's a grace to set you free from fear for tomorrow. Five more seconds. Who else? Come on, who else? So I'm done. I'm done with the fear. I'm done with the fear. I'm done with the fear. It's stealing sleep. It's stealing peace of mind. Some of you, it's generational. This has been a thing in your family line. The Lord wants to cut it now. 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 Yeah, come on. Now. Now it's cut by grace. By grace. By grace. All you got to do is stand and receive it. Who else? Come on. Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else?